Okay. Let's get going again here now. Uh, starting on the next question, multiple choice number 20 on page 16. Use the following information to answer the next question. More reading to do. Although, when we see this diagram, we know this, this is not an unfamiliar context to us like a lot of these readings are, right? We're, we're very familiar with this diagram, and we're very familiar with this context. Um, there is a very good chance that we'll see one of these on the diploma exam. Okay? For the first five, six times that this became a part of the curriculum, after this became a part of the curriculum, it appeared on the exam. No tricks to it. Just straightforward question, just like number 20. Okay? We've got to be able to solve this. Not that it's real easy, but it's predictable. There's no guarantees, but there's a good chance we're going to see something like this on the exam. We know, before we even read the question, we know that there's two equations that we're going to use to solve this question. One is V is equal to D over T, and the other is T is equal to 1 over F. Always. No exceptions to that. Always. We want to find the minimum frequency. We have to assume a speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8. The distance that we use here is going to be 70,000 meters, because it's there and back. The time, when we solve for the time, it ends up being 2.333 times 10 to the negative 4 seconds. What time does that represent? What time have I just found there? The time for one eighth of a revolution. We've got to check that and make sure it's an eight sided mirror, but it is. So it's the time for one eighth of a revolution. Remember, when we solve for a time in these qu equations or in these questions, it's never the time we want. So what do we got to do? Get the other one. Let's get the other one. If you have the time for one eighth of a revolution, how do you get the time for one revolution? Times it by eight. When we do, we get a period here of 0 0.0018667 seconds, which we're going to plug into here, end up solving for frequency, and it ends up being 536 hertz or 5.36 times 10 to the 2 hertz. Now, if I had to guess on this, and man, I sure hope you don't have to guess on this question, because it's a question that we can get. But if I had to guess, I would definitely guess A. The answer for frequency is usually in the hundreds range. B and C are the thousands. D is over 10,000, 34,000 actually. So those are unlikely to be the correct answers. Not impossible, but not likely. A is, is pretty reasonable, pretty common. 21. This one stumped me for a little bit, actually, when I first did this. Because the wording of the options is so close to being the same for, for all of them. It says, when white light is from the sun strikes a flint glass bead, the white light is separated in its component colors two of which are illustrated in the diagram below. So white light goes in, and you can see that violet light comes out one way and red light comes out another way. Which of the following statements contains a valid prediction of the relative indices of refraction for red light and violet light and a justification for that prediction? We don't even need this information to give you the prediction. Right? We know that if we think back to the prism and dispersion that we learned in class, we know that red light refracts the least, and violet light refracts the most, so red light has the lowest index of refraction, and violet light has the highest index of refraction. That make sense? We don't even need this diagram to answer the first part of this question. The index of refraction of red light is less than the index of refraction of violet light. Okay, we can predict that by looking at this diagram as well. You can see that that red light, follow its path, it does not refract as much in the flint glass bead as the violet light does. So therefore, the index of refraction for flint glass is less for red than it is for violet. Now let's justify it. By the way, let's, let's eliminate the possibilities here now. Um, the index of refraction for uh, red light and flint glass is greater? No. The index of refraction of violet light is less? No. We know it has to be B or C, because B, or C, B and C are the only ones that has red light producing a smaller index of refraction. So what's it going to be, B or C? This is where I got caught up when I was doing this answer key. Trying to decide between B and C. I thought, man, the wordings almost look the same. C says reflect. B says, what are we dealing with here? Refraction. So the answer is B. 
not only do you have to be good in physics to do this exam, you have to be good in English to do this exam, too. So you can catch those little things. Number seven. On a particular day, the index of refraction of a 5 megahertz radio signal in the Earth's atmosphere is 1.81. What's the critical angle? Now we can do this. Find critical angle, use Snell's law. Sine theta c over, it's really sine theta 1 over sine theta 2, right? Equals n2 over n1. But what's theta 2 when we're looking for the critical angle? Theta 2 will always be what? 90 degrees. Sine 90 is what? 1. So it becomes sine theta 1 or sine theta c is equal to n2 over n1. Um, we're going to solve for theta c here now. n2 is what? We've got 1 and we've got 1.81 for our indices of refraction. Where's the 1 going to go? n1 or n2? It's going to be n2. Because we've always got to go from a high index refraction. We've got to start with high, go to low. 1.81 to 1. Now, if you do that on your calculator the other way around, and you go 1.81 over 1, what's going to happen? You're going to get an error. So you're going to make a mistake, but your calculator is going to tell you you made a mistake. So you get a bit of a break on that one. Works out to be 33.5 degrees, by the way. Twenty-two. Oh, twenty-two. Did you make a mistake on that one? I did. When I did my answer key, first time I made a mistake on this one. Why did I make a mistake on it? Because I was being careless. Where's the careless part of this? Well, it says the distance from the object to the focal point is 2.4, and the distance from the focal point to the mirror is 4.3. So what? This is 2.4. This is 4.3. What's my object distance? 6.7. Focal length is 4.3. DO is 6.7. What do you think I made my object distance? I made it 2.4. Tells me the distance from the object, 2.4. I didn't even read it, right? Distance from the object to the focal point is 2.4? Okay, well, that's, that's not my object distance. My object distance is from the object to the mirror itself. And we can do that on our calculator. Do you guys need a refresher as to how to punch that in, or are you good with that? Good. The answer works out to be 12 centimeters. The biggest problem with that, I'm telling you, is, is this. And, and you know what? Go figure. I got an answer that was there. I don't remember which one it was, but... They design the questions that way. They know we're going to make that mistake. So don't fall into their little, their sneaky little trap. Student follows three procedures to study the properties of laser light. She uses a laser that contains monochromatic light. What does that mean, monochromatic light? One color, yeah. With a wavelength of four, 634 nanometers, which is 634 times 10 to the minus 9 meters. And you got a bunch of things here. It says the student first shines a laser through a crystal that has an index refraction of 1.53. We're going to assume that light is going from air to the crystal. So we're going to say N1 is 1.00 from air. This would be N2, therefore. Student shines the laser light through a diffraction gradient that is 5.0 times 10 to the 5 lines per meter. Tell me what that is. 1 over D. Remember we see lines per meter or lines per centimeter? It's 1 over D. 1 over the separation distance between the lines. No electric current is produced. What is that? Here we've got interference, right, and refraction. No electric current is produced. This looks like the photoelectric effect to me. 
that we shine laser light on a photovoltaic cell and there's no current produced, it's, well, it's not the photoelectric effect, it's the absence of the photoelectric effect, right? We're, we're below the threshold frequency there. All of that, and then we get a question that says the energy of one photon. E is equal to HC over lambda. Okay? So all we needed for that one question was this. Now, there are three more questions that go with this information, so odds are we're going to need some additional information. But for the first question, really straightforward, HC over lambda. Now, we're looking for an answer in joules. So what value of Planck's constant are we going to use? 6.63, right. 24 says, in procedure one, the wavelength of the laser light in the crystal is blank. The speed of the laser light in the crystal is blank than its speed in air. So for 24, the wavelength is, is what? Let's try lambda 1 over lambda 2, Snell's law, equals n2 over n1. Lambda 1 is 6.634 times 10 to the minus 9 over lambda 2, which is what we want, equals n2 over n1. Solve for lambda 2. And it works out to be 4.14 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. So the answer would be either A or B for multiple choice number 24. The speed would be what? Well, the wavelength has gone down. If the wavelength goes down, the speed goes down. So the wavelength has gone down, the speed goes down, both of which happen because the index of refraction went up, right? We could have predicted A without doing a single calculation, right? We know that the wavelength and the speed had to be lower because the index of refraction was higher. We know that both of those are inversely related to the index of refraction, right? Lambda 1 over lambda 2 equals lambda, or equals n2 over n1. So we did the calculation there. We didn't really need to. In the end, it would have been A had we just reasoned through it as well. Last question that goes with that information on page 18. In procedure 2, the angle between the central maximum and the first bright spot is what? Between the central maximum and the first bright spot. This is a, uh, this is a diffraction interference question, right? We've got a couple equations here. We've got lambda is equal to xd over n times l, and we've got lambda is equal to d sine theta over n. Why am I circling that equation? Because it's not valid sometimes, right? What's the cutoff about? About 10 degrees. Okay. Usually we say, though, what's kind of our rule of thumb on that one? Yeah, yeah. The higher it goes, the less valid it becomes. But You know what? It's irrelevant for this one, right? Because in the end, what are we looking for here? We're, we're, looking, for, we're looking for theta, right? We're looking for the angle. What are we going to have to use to find theta? We're going to have to use a second, right? D sine theta over m. So let's rearrange that to solve for, to solve for theta here. Um, to solve for theta, we're going to say uh, lambda times n over d equals sine theta. Theta that will therefore be equal to the inverse sine of lambda times n over d. What's d? We don't know. We can find it, though. We know that 1 over d is... 5.00 times 10 to the 5, go 1 over d, we end up getting, just one second, two seconds, guy. Okay. Um, we get the 2.0 times 10 to the negative 6 meters. Plug that in, we get an angle of 18.5 degrees. So we use that equation, we get 18.5 degrees. Had it worked the other way around, this equation wouldn't have been valid, right?
Ja. Yeah. Okay. You can't. No, you can't. Uh, the question, um, for everybody else that didn't hear it or didn't understand what the question was, uh, here we're dealing with a central maximum in the first bright spot. So there's no issue with the angle there, right? We always have to measure the angle from the central maximum. And since we're going from central maximum to first bright spot here, n would be equal to 1. Now, if you were going from the third maximum to the fifth maximum, n would be equal to 2, right? That's easy enough. But we couldn't use that with the d sine theta over n equation. So if you ever got a question that you're dealing with the third maximum and the fifth maximum, it pretty much has to be an angle that's, that's under 10 degrees, right, that allows you to use this equation. Make sense? Because, as I say, theta is always measured from the central, so you can't measure it from third to fifth. 25, in order to produce an electrical current in procedure 3, the student must use the electromagnetic radiation that has a blank wavelength or a photovoltaic plate that has a blank work function. Uh, we don't even need the information again. It never hurts to go back and look at it, but if you don't have a current being produced, we need a higher energy, right? How do you get a higher energy? Bigger frequency or smaller wavelength? So we want a shorter wavelength. Or we could have what kind of work function? Smaller work function, right? Because smaller work function requires less energy in order to get the electron out. So the answer would be C for that one. Well, 26 we got to get. We better make sure that we get 26 correct. Although you do have to be careful with some of these questions. 26 says, which of the following lists has selected regions of the EM spectrum arranged in order of increasing photon energy? How did we remember it? We memorized the list in terms of photon, in terms of photon frequency, right? But energy and frequency are directly related, so if, if we're remembering the list in terms of frequency, then it works in terms of energy as well. If the question says, though, increasing photon wavelength, then the answer is backwards, right? The answer here is infrared, ultraviolet, x-rays, gamma rays. If it was increasing photon wavelength, the answer would be, the answer would be C, gamma, visible, infrared, and microwaves. Does that make sense? Here's my suggestion for that question. You see that, whether you're asked for frequency, wavelength, or energy, write it out in terms of frequency. Start off with radio waves, microwaves. What do we got next? Infrared. Remember the song. I should play it for you guys right now. Uh, we got visible light. Then we got uh, ultraviolet, x-rays, gamma rays. So remember it in terms of frequency. Write it down in terms of frequency, and then, if you have to do it in terms of increasing wavelength, then go backwards. Just look at the list and go backwards. 27, a photocathode that has a, a, photocathode that has a threshold frequency of 5.6 times 10 to the 14 hertz is illuminated with light that has a frequency of 8.2 times 10 to the 14. What's the maximum kinetic energy? Straightforward question, but you know what? We're going to use the equation that doesn't appear on our data sheet, but I warned you about that, right? That's the one that you actually use the most often with the photoelectric effect. What is that equation? What is it a reflection of? The law of what? I've seen this question before where they've just simply given you that and said, this is really just the statement of the law of conservation of? The answer is energy. Yes, yeah, it's, it's the initial energy equals the final energy plus whatever we used up in the process, the work function. Looking for the maximum kinetic energy. We're looking for this variable right here. We've got H, we've got the frequency, the work function is, are we given a work function? We're not, but we can find the work function by saying H times the threshold frequency, right? So do the math on that one, it works out to be A, 1.7 times 10 to the negative 19. 28, the explanation of the Compton effect requires the, this goes along with the photoelectric effect. Both the photoelectric effect and the Compton effect are the particle nature of light. So B is the answer for that one. We're talking about particle nature of light, we're talking about Compton, we're talking about photoelectric effect, we're talking about the wave nature of light, we're talking about a polarization, interference, diffraction, refraction. We're talking about the wave nature of particles, 
like electrons, we're talking about the de Broglie hypothesis. Lots of little things that can easily be confused there, right? But distinct things that can easily be, be confused. 29, one immediate result of the discovery of the cathode ray particles was that the theory of the atom was revised to a theory that hypothesized that cathode ray particles. Who was that? Thomson, discovery of the electron. D is the answer. Go ahead. Uh, why couldn't it be A? Yeah, that, which means A is exactly the opposite answer to what we should have. Because A says an atom is indivisible sphere, right? Um, if, there's a good question. Uh, Rachel just missed uh, a, a little bit of the wording there, a prefix on that, right? Basically, she said, why couldn't the answer be A? One immediate result of the discovery of the cathode ray particles was that the theory of the atom was revised to a theory that hypothesized A, an atom of indivisible sphere. Well, because the discovery of the electron, which came from the cathode ray experiment, said that atom is not indivisible, but rather it's divisible. Right? You can break it up into electrons. And it didn't go much further than that, but... 30, the analysis of observations from the Rutherford alpha particle uh, scattering experiment, which was, remember, the gold foil experiment, uh, led to a model of the atom, or lead to a model of the atom in which the blank is in the order of 10 to the minus 10 in diameter, and the blank is in the order of 10 to the minus 15 meters in diameter, and the majority of the blank of the atom is in the nucleus. Lots of blanks. <laughs> you guys... You guys, by the time you get to question number 30 on the exam, might be saying lots of blanks, blankety blanks as well. Let's hope not. How are we supposed to know this? When I went through the Rutherford Gold Foil experiment with you, I didn't give you numbers. And you know what? I purposely didn't give you numbers. There's no need to remember numbers like this. So how are we supposed to answer this question if we haven't been taught numbers? Well, we dealt with two things, the atom itself and then the nucleus, right? Most of the atom is empty space, small, dense, positively charged nucleus inside. 10 to the minus 15 is smaller than 10 to the minus 10. What's smaller, the atom or the nucleus? The nucleus. So the atom is going to be in the range of 10 to the minus 10, because that's a bigger number, and the nucleus is going to be in the range of 10 to the minus 15, because that's a smaller number. You don't need to memorize those numbers. I don't have them memorized. Ask me two minutes ago what the, those numbers are, and I wouldn't be able to tell you. I just use reasoning to say, oh, it's got to be atom first, nucleus second. And the majority of the blank of the atom is in the nucleus. What is it? Mass, right. So the answer is C. Remember, small, dense, positively charged nucleus. Of course, in the atom, we usually have... Well, we always, in an atom, have equal numbers of protons and electrons. If it's not, then it's an ion, right? So we can't say the majority of the charges in the nucleus. There's equal charge in the nucleus and equal charge circling around the nucleus. Thirty-one. Now we're getting into some, some more recent stuff for us, right? Thirty-one. We got an electron level diagram. Some people don't like these questions. I do. I do, because there's really, they're really, if you know how to do them, they're really pretty straightforward questions. We want to know an electron in the 1.6, negative 1.6 electron volt energy level. It's right here. Okay, the electron is right here. The minimum frequency of a photon that would ionize the atom. To ionize it, we've got to get up to here. So the amount of energy that the photon needs to have, the amount of energy that needs to be absorbed by mercury is 1.6 electron volts. Does that make sense? Well, what's, the, what's going to be the minimum frequency of the photon then? Let's set it equal to h times f and solve for the frequency. Planck's constant is going to be 4.14 here. Solve for frequency, it works out to be uh, 3.9 times 10 to the 14. Here's the thing. You're dealing with a transition here from the 1.6 to the 0 level. 
1.6 to the point where it's ionized. What kind of EMR is that going to absorb? Well, almost certainly it's going to be infrared, visible light, or ultraviolet. What did I say? Occasionally, we're dealing with x-rays as if it's a really big transition. Well, that's not a really big transition. That's a pretty small transition. What are my options here? 10 to the 14, visible light. 10 to the 15, actually, uh, A is actually infrared, right? Barely, but it's infrared. Uh, B is ultraviolet. So both of those could be the answers. C and D? Gamma rays. It's not, it's not C and D. It's got to be either A or B. And it's a small transition, so I, I'd predict A if I had to guess on it. 32, for which of the following explanations did the diffraction of high-speed electrons provide experimental support? Remember the video that I showed you? The cartoon? Diffraction of electrons. Electrons go through both openings at the same time. The wave nature of particles, the wave nature of electrons, that was the de Broglie hypothesis, right? D. 32 is D. 33, hey, we're almost done here, guys. Thirty-three. Cobalt-60 is a common radiation source used in cancer treatment. The half-life of cobalt-60 is 5.2 years. Cobalt-60 nucleus decays by emitting a beta negative particle and a gamma photon. Which of the following equations describes the decay of cobalt-60? I like these ones, too. Like, we're going to get nuclear decay equations like this, and this is another one that we've got to get right. We can't mess up on these ones. Cobalt-60. Well, cobalt-60 is 6027. They don't tell us in the question that it's got an atomic number of 27. If you got something that said like 6027 and then 6028, how do you know which one's the one, the one? Check the periodic table. All four of them are the same here, so we don't need to worry about that. It decays into a beta particle, beta minus. That means that C and D can't be the correct answer. 0 plus 60 gives me 60. Minus 1 plus 28 gives me 27. That's going to be, I would look that up. It's going to be Ni. Uh-oh. They're both Ni. So which one is it? Why is it B? Because you get the antineutrino. Beta negative gives you an antineutrino. Beta plus gives you a neutrino. The percentage of cobalt-60 remaining after 15.6 after, uh, years? This is a pretty straightforward one. The half-life, we were told in the uh, information, was 5.2 years. The time is 15.6 uh, years. N is equal to T over T one-half, so it's going to be 3. If we're dealing with 3 half-lives, then we're going to say N is equal to N sub 0 one-half to the little n. We're going to start off with 100%, one half to the three, ends up being equal to 12.5%. This one, just this one doesn't say A doesn't B C or anything like that, right? It just says blank percent. So that's just going to be just a straight number, no no scientific notation for that one. Oh, we are so close. 34 energy is released in the nuclear fu fusion reaction because the mass of the alpha particle and the neutron is less than the mass of the intermediate product. It's a mass defect, right? As the reaction takes place, we lose mass. So the mass of whatever is produced in the end is less than the mass of what we had before mass defect. We had a question like that on our atomic physics test, I think, didn't we? It was real similar to that. D is the answer. Ten. At a particular instant, the electrostatic force that the deuterium ion exerts on the tritium ion is 23.3 newtons. The distance between the centers of the two ions is what? Let's get to the question here. Tells me that 
deuterium is H1 and tritium is H, sorry, is uh, H2 and H3. Deuterium is uh, H2, tritium is H3. How many protons does each one of these guys have? One. If they each have one proton, then the charge one and the charge two is both 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. What effect does the extra neutron have in that? Deuterium has one proton, one neutron. Tritium has one proton, two neutrons. What effect does the extra neutron have? Change the mass, but what effect does it have on the electrostatic force? None, because there's no, ex no difference in charge. So now we're just going to say F is equal to K, Q1, Q2 over R squared. Then we're going to rearrange that. It becomes the square root of K, Q1, Q2 over F. Plug your numbers in now. Here's one of those ones that's 10 to the minus W. 3.14 times 10 to the minus 15 it worked out to be. W is a two-digit answer, but we didn't need to express that, so we're just going to express it as 3.14. Additional information here. The direction of the magnetic deflecting force that acts on a positively charged deuterium ion as it just enters the magnetic field. Scroll down here so we can see that. Can't get to the right place here. Almost there. Here we are. The magnetic field is which way? They tell me actually the dot represents out of the page. We got a positive particle, so we're going to use a right hand rule for deflection, thumb in the direction of the particle. Fingers out of the page, palm points downward toward the bottom of the page. Five questions left. We're pretty much right on schedule here, guys. It's 36. Here's a good context question that you've never seen before. The neutron produced in the fusion reaction escapes the magnetic confinement. Well, what's this, what's this whole magnetic confinement thing? Oh, let's go back to the information. The bottom of, at the bottom of the information on page 24, it says, a particular reactor design uses magnetic fields in a process called magnetic confinement to keep the ions inside the reactor. Why does a neutron escape that? In order to experience a magnetic force, it has to have a charge. Neutrons don't have a charge. A, neutral particles are not deflected by magnetic fields in 36. Thirty-seven. As a particular neutron traveling at 5.21 times 10 to the 6 meters per second hits the lithium blanket and stops, it experiences an impulse of what? Impulse. All of a sudden we're, all of a sudden we're doing the impulse now. It's back in unit one, our momentum unit. Well, we know that impulse is equal to, there we are. It's equal to F times delta T, and it's equal to M times delta V. The mass of the lithium is uh, in the information. 1.67 times 10 to the minus uh, 27. Uh, sorry, the mass of the neutron, I should say. Right, the mass of the neutron. 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 on your data sheet. Delta V is 5.21 minus 0, or 0 minus 5.21. Multiply those together, we get negative 8.7 times 10 to the minus 21. How do you know it's inelastic? Oh, be careful. Yeah, be careful, though. That's a good, that's a good point. Uh, Rachel said, I always thought it was if it was subatomic particles, then it would be inelastic because they don't compress. Okay. How do we know that this one is inelastic? Sorry, you said that you thought it would be elastic because it doesn't compress. How do we know that this one is inelastic? Because they, they stick together. Okay? Now, we never said that subatomic collisions are always elastic. We said that in order to get a truly elastic collision, you need subatomic particles. It doesn't mean that it's always elastic. If they stick together, then it's, gonna be, it's still going to be inelastic. Okay?
38. Which of the following nuclear equations most likely describes a neutron lithium collision? Huh, it's a bit of a tough one. Which two can we eliminate right away? C and D. Because that's not the isotope notation for a neutron. That would be a positron. This would be a proton. So both of them are, neither of them are a neutron, right? Both of them are wrong. So A and B seem to work. Which one's more likely? Well, let's see which one balances out. 1 and 7 makes 8. 0 and 3 makes 3. Okay, that one seems to work. 1 and 4 makes 5. 0 and 3 makes 3. Uh-oh. That one seems to work, too. So which one's more likely? Why? Why is A more likely? Yeah, this number right here can change, right, with each isotope of lithium. But it's unlikely that you'd get three protons and one neutron in the same nucleus, right? It's usually, especially with small nuclei, closer to 50-50. So three protons and four neutrons makes a lot more sense than three protons and one neutron. Notice it said most likely, though. Right? They're not, we're not saying that B is an impossibility. We're saying that A is more likely because of the number of neutrons in there. 39. To study subnuclear sub structure, high energy particles are accelerated or accelerators are required because we have to. We have to do what? We have to break them apart. And what, and what do we have to do to break them apart? We have to break the nuclear force. So the answer is D. You want to break apart the piñata? You need a lot of energy. You can't just, you can't just throw a wiffle ball at a piñata because that's not enough energy to break the bonds that exist between the molecules of the cardboard and the, and the piñata. you got to smack it with a baseball bat or take a slap shot at it with a hockey puck. You have to overcome those forces. And finally, number 40. Good way to end a test, right? Number 40. I think this, I think this is a question that we, can, that we can definitely do. Which of the following decay equations describes beta positive? Well, we don't have to have this memorized, even though it was in our notes. We can figure it out. Beta positive, we know, has a proton, uh, a proton changing into a neutron plus a positron. Well, proton is what? Up, up, down. Don't remember that? Figure it out. Two-thirds, two-thirds, negative a third, and if you don't remember those charges, just check your data sheet. That gives me a total charge of one, so that must be a proton. Decays into a neutron, that's going to be up, down, down. Check that. Two-thirds, negative a third, negative a third gives me charge of zero. So that's a neutron plus a positron. Let's see which one matches up there. Up, up, down, up, down, down. Uh-oh. We got uh, to C and D both work. No, they don't. What's wrong with C? What is it? It's an electron, right? They should have given you another option there with a same answer as D, except with a with an anti-neutrino. But we know that it's beta positive, so we know it's got to be a neutrino. Anyway, look at it. Good. Look at that. Look at that timing, guys. It's 3:02 right now. How perfect was that? How do you feel about that? There's some tough questions there, right? But what you got to remember, what you got to remember is this: for every really tough question we found, there was at least that many pretty easy questions, and then there was a number of questions that were in the middle. Okay, if we can get all of the easy questions, and then we can get most or all of the medium questions, hey, we're going to do okay. 
even if we don't get any of the really tough questions we're going to do ok if we can happen to get a few of the tough ones as a bonus then that's great but if we can get all of the easy and most of the medium questions we're going to be in pretty good shape here so when you walk out of the exam when you walk into the exam don't panic when you see that hard question you know you're going to see those hard questions just take solace in the fact that you'll also see easy questions pay attention to little things right units pay attention to you know was there an initial speed you know pay attention to you know which constant to use rounding and all, all those little things get all those easy questions get all those medium questions and we're we're going to be in good shape all right that's it